Chapter Thirteen of Grace Harlowe Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane. Chapter Thirteen: An Inquisitive Passenger. What a wonderful driver you are! Observed Madame. You must teach me to drive a car. How I should love it! Grace brought her car to a quick stop when a French sentry barred their passage. He inquired who they were and where they were going, which Madame answered in French, not knowing that Grace understood. The Countess told him that Mrs. Gray was a Red Cross official on her way to Juilly, with supplies for the hospital there, and Grace tried hard not to show her amazement. She felt her face getting hot, but fortunately her passenger did not observe it. After taking the names of the occupants of the ambulance, destination and other details, the sentry permitted the car to pass. "'They are troublesome creatures, after all,' murmured the Countess. "'I shall be glad indeed when the war is at an end and one is free to go and come. But war is war and spies appear in many guises. The French must be ever on their guard. Turn here, my dear,' she directed, pointing to a side road. Grace stopped her car, and, taking out her road map, studied it for a moment or two. "'You are in error, Countess. The direct road to Julie lies straight ahead. Look, is it not so?' she added, offering the map to her passenger. "'Yes, I know, but the road to the right is much the better road. You will go that way, will you not? If you think that is the best road, yes. It is.' There are many troublesome spots in the main road owing to the heavy traffic of camions and cars. The explanation appeared perfectly reasonable to Grace, who turned her car into the side road, for which she was rewarded with a gentle pat on her shoulder and a smile of appreciation from her passenger. You are a dear. We must see a great deal of each other. I hear you had a most unpleasant experience on your way across. You mean the Holborn? Yes, indeed, but fortunately we are none the worse for it. I think we were in more danger from the night air raids. I understand that none of the soldiers was lost. There was only one boat missing, and that was picked up later. Were there many of them aboard? Something like two thousand, I believe. A regiment, I presume. Let me see. I read something about that. It was the... the... how provoking! You must know what regiment it was, my dear. "'Yes, I know,' answered Grace laconically. "'This old car acts as if it were going to fall to pieces, doesn't it, Countess?' Madame de Beaupré flushed at the rebuff, and for a few moments there was silence between them, which Madame finally broke with a merry laugh. "'You are a wise little woman. "'But remember, my dear, we are allies. "'You need feel no restraint in speaking freely with me, "'though I admire your reticence regarding affairs military.' "'The conversation drifted to a general discussion of the war, "'about which our passenger told Grace many things of a more intimate nature, "'shedding new light on what already had been accomplished "'and France's dire need at the time America entered the great world conflict. "'I understand you have fully half a million men on this side of the water already, "'and that three million more are being fitted out to come over. "'I do not know about the number here now. "'I should say, however, that it was less than the number you mention, "'perhaps two hundred thousand or something like that. "'As for those who will come over, their number is unlimited. "'America can put more than five million men on the battlefront in a year or less. "'We are a big and resourceful country, Countess.' I'm aware of that. I visited America some years ago and was amazed at what I saw. It was wonderful, such buildings, such industries, such progress and such masterful men. Such is America. Grace was pleased at the characterization. Her passenger asked in detail about her friends of the Overton unit and led Grace on to speak of her husband and the regiment he was with. Taking it all in all, Madame, by adroit questioning, gleaned considerable information, though Grace was cautious, not that she suspected her passenger, but that she did not wish to reveal anything that she should not. What she had told her companion, Grace reasoned, might be learned from many persons in Paris, or perhaps from observation, so no harm could possibly have been done. 
The way to Juilly, however, seemed much longer to her than thirty miles, and as there was no indicator on the dashboard, she could only guess at the distance they had come. They were now travelling through open country, dotted with pleasant homes and little farms, on which only women were seen at work, with the exception that here and there children were assisting them. At one of these little homes the Countess begged Grace to halt for a moment. "'They have the most delicious milk here, and I simply cannot pass without having a glass of it. "'May I fetch you a glass of milk, Mrs. Gray? "'I believe I really would enjoy a glass of milk. Thank you so much.' "'Shall I go in with you to save you the trouble of carrying it out to me?' The Countess protested that she could not think of permitting such a thing, and stepping from the car, she ran lightly up to the open door, where Grace saw her greeted deferentially. The Countess stepped into the cottage, and Grace saw her hand the woman of the house something, which she at first thought was money, but as the peasant woman held it up, folding it between her hands, Grace uttered a little exclamation. It was not money that the Countess was handing the woman, and which she stowed away in the pocket of her dress. A few moments later the Countess came out with two glasses of milk, and together they drank of the rich milk that Grace realised was mixed with cream. It was the first of its kind that she had had since leaving Haven Home, where two Jersey cows kept the household supplied. "'Delicious, isn't it?' questioned the Countess. "'It is indeed.' I thought you would enjoy it and consider it well worth the extra mile or so that we have travelled to get it, though the recollection of this place did not come to me until I sighted the cottage. I think we are ready now. Are you going to return the glasses? No, let the woman come out and get them. It is not wise to be too deferential to these peasant people. Grace bit her lips to keep back the reply that she was on the point of uttering. A little further on they swung into the main highway and completed their journey to Juilly without further incident. The hospital there was a venerable old building, before the war a seat of learning known as the College of Juilly, and already there were several hundred patients there, including many Americans. Grace delivered her supplies, for which she got a receipt from Major Coleman, an American surgeon who was in charge of the hospital. Grace introduced the Countess to him and left her there while she herself, conducted by an officer, made the rounds of the hospital, talking with the men and distributing cigarettes and chocolate to those who were permitted to have them. The presence of this lovable American girl with a smile on her face and another smile in her voice was like a breath from home for the soldier sufferers. For three hours Grace Harlowe talked to them, read to certain of them, held the hands of the few whom the surgeon told her soon were going west, the soldier parlance for dying. She forgot the passage of time and everything else except the men of her race until the countess sent in to remind her that the hour was getting late. Grace went through the wards, bidding the men good-bye and promising to come again and as often as she could. The Countess declared that she had had a perfectly delightful chat with Major Coleman, who appeared to be quite taken with her, as Grace later expressed it. Madame Jean was in high humour as they drove rapidly back toward Paris, Grace taking the main road and wondering why her passenger did not suggest going the longer way on account of the roads. There was nothing the matter with the main road so far as Grace Harlow could see, and good time was made all the way along, except as they had frequently to draw off to one side of the road to permit the passage of what Grace called caravan, a long procession of army trucks on their way toward the lines. Many of the drivers, observing that a woman was driving the ambulance, saluted gravely, while others grinned and waved their hands in friendly fashion. Grace always answered these salutations in kind, much to the interest of her passenger. "'You Americans are such wonderful mixers,' declared the Countess. "'You have the knack of adapting yourselves to any company, to any situation. "'Why not? We are all human beings. "'Though some of us are not wholly human, I—' "'A hissing sound interrupted her. "'Madame de Beaupré started. "'What, what is it?' "'Only a tire, that's all,' replied Grace disgustedly. "'Oh, it sounded every bit like a shell going over. "'You have heard shells? "'You have been under fire?' questioned Grace "'as she brought her car to a quick stop. "'Once in the early days of the war, 
In fact, I was under fire all of one night when stopping with friends of mine in a chateau up north. Do you know, ever since then, whenever I hear the air escaping from an automobile tyre, I think a shell is coming straight toward me. How interesting. I should like to experience real fire, artillery fire, and I hope to before I go home. Just now we have something fully as important on hand. Grace got out a jack and jacked up the car, after which she hammered and worked with all her strength to get the shoe off. This finally was accomplished, her uniform covered with a long linen duster that reached to the ankles, a pair of thin soiled gloves on to protect her hands. Strong and self-reliant as those slender hands were, Grace Harlowe's pride was in keeping them in perfect shape. She believed that hands and hair were women's chief claim to beauty, and acted accordingly. If I drive a car over here much more, I think I shall send to America for my own little car, she declared. At least I could go out with reasonable assurances of getting back pretty nearly at the time I had planned. The Countess seemed ill at ease, which Grace put down to her annoyance at being late in getting home. After a half hour's hard work, the tyre was repaired and replaced, and the driver, face smudged with dirt, hopped in and started away. Thank goodness that is finished. How far are we from Paris? I should say about twenty kilometres. So near as that? We shall make it, provided we have no more difficulties with this rattle-trap car. Oh, there it goes again. Countess, you will be sorry you ever came out for a drive with me. This surely is my unlucky day. Instead of the repaired tyre going out, it was the tyre on the other side, and once more Grace put on her duster and gloves and got to work. Darkness was almost upon them when she finished and announced herself as ready. From that on to the city limits, Grace Harlow gave her passenger a ride, the like of which the Countess admitted she had never before experienced. The light car rattled and banged and skidded perilously when turning out for other vehicles, until the Countess, clinging to the side with firm hands, begged her driver to reduce speed. Sorry, but we must take time or we shall be in difficulties. At last they reached the outskirts of Paris, and there they were brought to an abrupt halt by two soldiers who stepped into the middle of the road, holding their rifles up above their heads at right angles to their bodies, thus barring the way. Here our troubles begin, announced Grace Harlow Gray. She believed that being late they would be held up outside of Paris for the night and be compelled to sleep in their car but the difficulties in which they were soon to find themselves were of a much more serious nature than the mere being late in seeking entry to the city. End of chapter 13 Recording by Ashley Jane